Welcome to the McMillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Elizabeth Bradley, Faculty Director for the Global Health Initiative and the Global Health Leadership Institute, both of which are at Yale. She is also a professor of public health at Yale's School of Public Health. Professor Bradley's research focuses on health delivery systems and quality improvement and has contributed important findings about organizational change and quality of care within the hospital, nursing home, and hospice settings. She has been involved with several projects that aim to strengthen health systems in international settings, including China, Ethiopia, Liberia, South Africa, and the United Kingdom. Today we talk with Professor Bradley about her new book she wrote with Lauren Taylor titled The American Healthcare Paradox, Why Spending More is Getting Us Less. Welcome Professor Bradley. Thank you so much. Let's begin with an overview of your book. Tell us about it. The book tries to take a new look at health and healthcare in the United States. We're trying to understand the major paradox and problem in our country, which is why is it that we spend more than any other country in healthcare expenditures, but our population is no healthier for it. We take a look at what other countries do, we take a look at some best practices in the United States, and give a bit of a historical analysis and looking to the future what we might do better. Okay, and what led you to write the book? I actually think I got the idea in 2006 when I had a sabbatical. At that time, I was developing the very first course at Yale University for undergraduates on U.S. healthcare policy. Mm -hmm. I did an extensive historical analysis to prepare for teaching that course and realized 100, 150 years ago we really looked at healthcare differently. And it got me thinking we should be looking at healthcare more broadly. Maybe we could actually learn from our past to understand better what we might do in our future. Okay. That got me going. Okay. And I know you, you undertook extensive research to do the book. Tell yes. us about that. What did you do? Yeah. Well, we took a comprehensive approach. Mm -hmm. We used a lot of different methods, a few of them. We used a statistical analysis first to really understand across the world those countries that are, have different spending patterns. How is it related to their health outcomes across mm -hmm. the world? Then we also took a very deep analysis of the history that created the system we have. Uh, and we also looked at the World Values Survey, which is something, a great data source that few people have used before, that takes a look at how different countries value healthcare and other mm -hmm. social goods in their countries differently. The last thing we did is we spent about six months reviewing four outstanding cases in the United States that we think really have something that all of us could learn from and how to better coordinate their health care services. Okay, so I'd like to get to that um, in a minute. Let's first look at Scandinavia. I know Scandinavia is at the top of the health care um, uh, ladder, so to speak, in terms of what it's providing to its people, yeah. and then you compared it to what the United States yep. is um, all about. So yes. wh what did you find? Well, first, a couple of the facts are, uh, in Scandinavia, their infant mortality rates are about half of what the United States are. Mm -hmm. their, um, our maternal mortality rates are six times higher than those in Scandinavia. Their life expectancy is longer than ours. And yet we're spending 18% of our GDP on health care. They're only spending 10% of their GDP on health care. Wow. How could this possibly How be? How could it be? What we found is the two ways to organize services are very different. In the United States, we actually spend only about 10% of our GDP on social services, things that are like education, housing, nutrition, um, employer training, only about 10% of our GDP on that. If we go to Scandinavia, it's just the opposite. They're spending about 20% of their GDP on this. Mm -hmm. So we have completely different, almost inverted patterns of spending social dollars to achieve a healthy population. And what we find is the Scandinavian model, which recalibrates how much is spent on medical care as opposed to how much is spent on these other social services is very critically important to whether you're going to get good health outcomes in the whole population. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now in terms of some of the programs in the United States that are um, doing it correctly, so to speak. Yeah. Talk about some of those models and why they are exemplary. Yeah. Well, what's unusual about each of these models? 
uh, is that they really coordinate the medical care services with the social services. So they do not look at a patient only for their biological determinants of health and mm -hmm. what medicine they need and whether they need to be in a hospital. They look at it holistically. Where is the person living? What kind of job do they have? What kind of education are they getting? Are they in the training programs they need to be in? And these, um, uh, these, event, these uh, ways to coordinate these services we're finding leads to better outcomes and really less expensive overall services. Mm -hmm. The ones that we looked at cross a gamut. Actually, several people have discussed this happening for low-income patients, but we found examples where this was used for middle class and high-income patients as well, a holistic view of health. One of the most interesting, I think, um, is in Oregon, in Portland, Oregon. Uh, where it's a combination of a very tertiary, important, high-tech hospital with community-based uh, centers, mm -hmm. really. Um, and they have created something called C-Train, which is uh, an interest in the community train to be able to integrate what is really the medical care system with some of the other services that keep somebody healthy, mm -hmm. such as housing, education, nutrition support, exercise, lifestyle, mm -hmm. counseling, psychiatric care. These things end up, I think, being almost useless if they aren't integrated well. Mm -hmm. It's the same population that one is caring for, but you, if you only look at the medical care side, mm -hmm. you can end up really missing some important pieces. Where I am struggling is how to understand how they do integrate those social services. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because, you know, I'm familiar with you know my personal history with yeah. the health care system yeah. so I'm curious to see how my experience differs from the Portland experience yeah. for instance well for instance um, they have a joint record so that in fact if you are receiving any kind of services from the community center this that information would flow smoothly between the medical care system and the community center so for instance let's say you went to job training and you were getting counseling on how you, you might have just faced a layoff and you were trying to be counseled into what kind of job you could get next the if in fact you also ended up being in the hospital because your diabetes care wasn't going right, the, the people taking care of you in the hospital would know this person is actually on the path to getting a new job, this is where she's actually mm -hmm. struggling, this is where things are going better. And the result of being able to integrate across those services, you can plan better. You can think, hmm, how would I plan the medical care so that this person really does stay employed or is in a place where they'll be able to really get that job? Mm -hmm. That would be one example. Um, but we also see it in terms of people who are in public housing or they may uh, be in an educational system where you begin to integrate what is the school record with what really is the health care record. Mm -hmm. It's looking at it that way to, to understand that m much more than medical care is really what keeps us healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering, again, s in Scandinavia, it seems like the costs are flip-flopped and I'm thinking about how would that relate here in this country in terms of the costs associated yeah. with having a more holistic approach right. being taken? It's a great question and we have to be extremely careful. We have to do this in an American way, uh, which means that I don't think we can spend not even a dime more. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do believe what we could think about is having our health care dollar achieve some of the social aims that will ultimately save health care dollars in the mm -hmm. long run. Uh, for instance, creating incent incentives such that our health care dollars could be spent in ways that think about um, improving people's the other determinants of health both in terms of job training in terms of education housing as we've talked about we today a hospital itself or physicians themselves are really incentivized um, they are rewarded when the patient stays ill mm -hmm. how do we change that how do we change that so they are rewarded when the patient stays healthy? Mm -hmm. That's what we don't, we haven't mastered that in the right. United it, States, but we need to. It seems like it would be a huge cultural undertaking no in order to make that happen. No question, and I should be clear about that in our book. Um, the most we can really think about is changing or adding a little bit to the public discourse on this issue. Mm -hmm. we, we really need to stop understanding health as medicine. They're two different things and to start thinking about health and health care as distinct and how do we stay healthy as a society. Each one of us has some ability for that but also are building our system that way. And mm -hmm. Our book I hope will add to the discourse 
I don't think there's a magic bullet out there. Mm -hmm. um, if, if we had to try to fix it in, with one kind of thing, what would, what would you say was yeah. most important? The thing right away is we have to change the dialogue around this issue. Mm -hmm. um, that means the media, that means the President of the United States, that means our hospital administrators. That means you and me. We have to change the dialogue to think that health is a holistic concept, that many things add to our health, and you can't always turn to the medical environment to make you healthy. Mm -hmm. Is there, do you think there is a dialogue that is starting? Is there a trend out there moving in this direction? I really think there is. Yeah. I, you know, I think we're close to a tipping point in mm -hmm. some ways. When you look at the number of industries that are starting to pop up, that are going to start to be rewarded for keeping people healthy. I think people are starting to see the niche. Um, that will make an enormous difference. Mm -hmm. You know, we look at Nike and some of the things they're doing, very innovative things to try to incentivize people to run and get some financial benefit from mm -hmm. that. That's a way of creating an industry instead of, as our medical care industry is one that's rewarded when people stay sick. Can we create an industry that is rewarded when people stay healthy? Mm -hmm. And I wow. think we're getting there. I hope so. Yeah. Thank you very much for being here with us today and sharing some of your work. My pleasure. Thank you. For more information about Professor Bradley and her research, please visit our website at yale.edu backslash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. Thank you.